Today's episode is proudly brought to you by Ambeezy. Hello, my name's Rebecca Tapp and welcome to Decoding Purpose. The word purpose has worked its way into part of our everyday vocabulary, not just in business, but also in our personal lives. So where do we begin with such a big concept? And what are some of the steps we can take to explore our purpose and apply it to our lives? In Decoding Purpose, we unlock the minds of on-purpose activists, innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, creatives, spiritual thinkers, and everything else in between. Welcome to the podcast, Decoding Purpose. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Today's guest is Dan Pontefract and Dan is a renowned voice in organisational culture, leadership and of course the activation of purpose both personally and professionally. He is the author of several books, including The Purpose Effect. He's spoken at a number of TED events, and he regularly writes for the likes of Forbes, Harvard Business Review, and The Huffington Post. Now, Dan certainly has a whole list of credentials when it comes to showcasing his expertise as a a purpose-driven influencer and thought leader. But the one thing that I really enjoyed about today's podcast was Dan's generosity in sharing his personal experiences of purpose, personal case studies, and really being able to articulate so beautifully what it is to step into the journey of purpose. In today's conversation, Dan and I unpacked a whole range of myths about purpose. We looked at the the three different types of purpose, including personal purpose, organizational purpose, and role purpose. And we decoded what Dan calls the sweet spot in between. It was truly a delight to interview Dan, and I'm equally delighted to share this conversation with you. Welcome to the podcast. Dan, I'm going to start today with a question that I ask every guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast. And that question is whether you think purpose is fate or a choice that we make. Oh, uh, is a multiple choice, uh, does it allow for a third answer? By the way? You, you can have a third answer in there, absolutely. <laughs> because sometimes I think it's a bit of both. Um, Ultimately, I think purpose sometimes will come to you as a result of you pushing for it, right? You're, you're learning about yourself. You are uh, striving to become that better person of self, better person of planet, better person of community, of family, of work. But sometimes serendipity kicks you right in the butt and says, hey, have you thought of this? And you don't know that you hadn't thought of it. And so... You know, there, let's, let's kind of break this down in, into context here. Um, I am uh, a boy right now. I'm 16 years old, and I have just uh, got my knee taken out by another soccer player, a football player. And, and I'm devastated because I now have to go out into the night, and I'm now in an operating room, and I'm 16 years old, and I'm thinking, my gosh, am I going to make it? And then I make it but I have to go to physio for the next six months. And whilst I'm traversing into the physio shop, I get to know uh, the people that are physiotherapists. And they are these wonderful, purpose-driven folk that I had never knew existed because I had never been in a physiotherapy shop in my life. And that was one of the crystal kind of seed moments for me that said, hey, I think I'm here to help people because I want to be like that physio. That physio is a lot of fun, but it's helping someone become uh, themselves or you know help themselves out. So I wouldn't really have known that physiotherapists exist as a 16-year-old, and it wouldn't have changed my thinking about how, maybe why I'm on this earth. Like, am I here to help? Yeah, I want to be like the physio. It's fantastic. And then, however, I as that seed was planted, the serendipity of the moment, mm-hmm. Then, you know, I'm pushing towards a uh, kind of a life of purpose of helping others. And so I guess that's why I said on the fence of this one, Rebecca. It's, uh, I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, a combination between synchronicity and intention. Ah, good word. Exactly. <laughs> 
So, Dan, the definition of purpose is something that can be looked up in the dictionary. However, in my experience, the explanation of purpose is a little more complex and it's, you know, it's deeply personal in its expression. Based on your lived experience, uh, how would you explain purpose? Well, uh, ultimately, I believe that uh, purpose is kind of sort of paying homage to Joseph Campbell, right? It's the possibility of bliss. And bliss comes in different forms, right? And that's why I think purpose, as you say, is it's difficult to define outright, but I think there are different definitions of bliss. And, and purpose, er, ergo, comes from self. There's a personal purpose. You know, why am I here? Uh, how am I going to show up each and every day? How do I want to be known when I leave a room? So there's this kind of really deep sense of personal purpose. There are two other really important types of purpose. The, the organization is made up of people, the place in which we work. And so whether you're public sector, whether you're government, whether you're not-for-profit or for-profit, whether you work for yourself, um, that organization, so too, has a purpose. It, it's there for something. And I think that's the crux of the issue is many organizations are unclear as to why they're here or there. And they're perhaps there for the solitary reason of making money and crushing the earth. So that's not cool. But then there's another type of purpose, right? And that's role. Like we all play a role in the place of work of which we get paid for the 40, 50 hours a week we work. So there's a definition that, that says um, if I feel bliss in my role, then I must also be able to be creating value and thus I'm valued in the role in which that I work in. So I think you can get um, caught up potentially in there being one definition of purpose. But I think when you do look at it like a Venn diagram, then you look at it as if it's the intersection of your life. Because in life, we have personal parts and we have work parts. And sometimes they intersect. But the point of purpose is that how do you make that intersection feel as though that it's no longer the possibility of bliss, but that it's blissful? How's that? I love that. And I love the framing around bliss and following your bliss uh, because it's an experience. It's an energy in motion. It's something you feel in the present mm. moment. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to describe purpose. I'm right with you. All right. <laughs> so when I talk to people about purpose, so many people reflect on a key turning point or a moment, moment of time that stands out. And I know you just spoke about um, the physiotherapist example. Uh, along with that, do you remember your, your first experience of purpose and what about that experience was significant with regards to who you are today? Well, um, here's, here's how I'll describe it. So when I um, was under that operating table, uh, sort of under the knife with the knee injury, I was desperately trying to make the Canadian national soccer team as a kid. And so I had recovered and got back to my normal self. And, and then I'm in tryouts for the national team again. And and, and the lads who were sort of in this camp to be selected for this national team, there was, whatever, 25 of us, right? The end of the camp occurred. And then the team management sort of came on this stage in this auditorium that we're in, and they started calling out the, the names of the folk who were selected to the team. So the guy got the microphone, you know, Paul Pesci Salido. And Paul would be called up, shake hands, goes off to another room, gets carded, and he made the team. Well, come to the end of that session, and I'm still in the audience. And the coach comes up to that microphone and says, well, that's the squad. Better luck next time, lads. And he walks off the stage, and he leaves the seven of us in the room, like, bawling, you know, crying our ears mm -hmm. out and our eyes out because, you know, we had made the team. But there's a very anti-purpose example, meaning – I never want anyone to feel that self-loathing and, and uh, sort of disgust and, and, and as if the world is crumbling because that really affected me deeply. Like 
greatly. And, and for me, I didn't write my declaration of personal purpose for years to come, but it informed me. That whole episode of that sort of sociopathic, hierarchical, unempathetic leadership of these, these coaches, yep. right, it changed me. And so, so that's what not to do, I guess. Purpose is about, it's about care. It's about, it's about love, ultimately. It's about empathy. It's about compassion. It's about connection. Doing something bigger than yourself. It's about connection, exactly. Mm. Mm. So, so that affected me greatly, Rebecca. And as I said, it, it, it led me to a point in which I kind of unknowingly, as a teenager and early adult, went into uh, careers and roles and, and ways of, of operating, not wanting to treat anyone that way. And for those of us in, you know, our, our everyday working life who are listening to the podcast right now, you've just discussed what purpose isn't. What does purpose feel like when we land on it? And, and I know you've referenced the idea of bliss, but how, how do we know in a job whether we're connecting to that sense of meaning or even if we're at school or uni or whoever's listening out there, how would they know if they'd landed on that feeling of purpose? Hmm. Yeah, it, it seems at times ethereal, it seems at times uh, impossible, but I assure you it is. And it's that intersection, again, between those three types of purpose, right? The personal, the role, the organization. I, I mean, I cheekily call it the sweet spot. And when you know you're in the sweet spot, it's when you wake up, and whether it's a Monday or a Saturday, so whether it's work or life, you know, you're not dreading anything. You want to get up on a Saturday and, and go. You want to get up on a Monday and go. Because whether it's work or life, it's like you've, you've found it. You're not dreading a thing. So that's kind of the personal question you got to ask is, is like, do I dread anything? Or am I actually looking forward to whatever the day has in store for me? If it's a weekend or a weekday or I'm on holiday, right? But then, okay, let's hypothetically go to the, the work week for a second. If you're on your commute in on the metro, the bus, the car, the boat, um, whatever, and again, you're dredging up uh, sort of ways in which not to go to work, or you're you're dredging up ways in which to sort of delay going to work. Like that, that is kind of clear indicators that there are, there's pieces of the puzzle that aren't in play. Like you're not in an engaging work environment, mm. maybe. Maybe you've got bosses that are being hierarchical or whatever, territorial or fear, fearful to you. Uh, maybe the organization is not ethical. So, great example uh, today, in fact, as we're recording this podcast, the CEO of Wells Fargo, uh, America's second largest bank, uh, has announced his sudden retirement. And, and, and if you know the Wells Fargo story, it has been lambasted over the last three, four years of such unethical practices that I don't know why anyone still works there. Mm. And I have talked to tens of different Wells Fargo employees who are like, gosh, I just wish I could find another gig, another job. And they're, they're literally in what I call, if you think about the role purpose now, a job mindset. They're just in it for a paycheck. They're just in it to, to check in, check out. They're, they're disaffected and they're disengaged and disenfranchising them. So it's that intersection, Rebecca. It really is about you saying, gosh, I, I love getting up and going to work or going to the weekend, whatever. I love the organization because they stand for something. You know, they're like the Patagonians of this world or the G diapers in Australia. Um, they're, they're like the Whole Foods, right? They're these organizations that are here for more than just making money. Now, I'm going to go into lots of other questions with regards to the intersection that you're talking about and the sweet spot. I was watching your TED Talk on the purpose effect, and in that talk, you spoke about this idea that as children, we embrace the joy of purpose and the vision that purpose holds so beautifully for the creation of our future self. Why is it that as we get older, we kind of fall asleep and, and disconnect from that innate expression of, of who we really are? And what does it take to reawaken ourselves to the belief in the possibilities of purpose? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, sometimes I joke around in, in some of my consulting or my keynotes. I start bringing up books like, um, you know, The Giving Tree or I Love You So Much or Oh, The Places We Go. And then I ask the question, were we lied to? Because <laughs> um, all those great children books are fantastic. But as, as we get into the organization, my cheeky comment about being lied to is, is that leaders seem to have succumbed to something that might be coined organizational helplessness, meaning kind of like the Martin Seligman study from several years ago about learned helplessness. I kind of cheekily take that and say, are leaders just mimicking one another to create these environments of fear and hierarchy and collusion almost? It's as, a, as though some of these leaders, many of them, in fact, will go into the organization and they'll put on an anti-empathy suit or an anti-compassion suit. It's like they have to be jerks. I don't get it. And so you come to work and you're like bushy-eyed and, and, and got this big grin on your face and you're 23 years old. You're coming out of uni and you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then eventually it catches up with you and, and you, you learn to be helpless, meaning you're just, you're just doing what everyone else is doing and you're hoarding or you're creating fear or you're demanding or you're uh, controlling or you're commanding like all these old um, kind of Maslow uh, anti Maslow like hierarchy stances. It's all bottom of the barrel stuff. It's as though, you know, we, 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 we get into that organization story and we say, we have to act differently. We can't be that compassionate, benevolent person anymore. We have to be malevolent and sort of, as I say, anti-compassionate. Mm. Why, why, Rebecca? Yeah, right? look, it's, that crushes the soul. It's almost like we, we go into these situations and, and because we can't be vulnerable and, and open and heart-centered, all of a sudden we need to build these walls around us that close us in in order to feel protected, but in some ways that in itself is what's sending us to sleep and sending us into a, a form of amnesia, forgetting who we really are. <laughs> <laughs> it is a form. It's a corporate form of amnesia. Yeah, That's exactly yeah. it. <laughs> but then ironically, right, ironically, these men and women who are in the leadership roles who are squashing purpose with lots of the employees, well, they go home and, and, and I've talked to some of them, then they feel guilt, <laughs> Like they go home and they play with their kids or they're playing in the community soccer league or they're, you know, volunteering at the church, whatever. And they feel guilt for doing what they do during the day. So then you got to ask yourself, why do they do it? Mm. And in a for-profit organization, I can assure you, I'll tell you why. It's because the organization is set up for a profit-only mindset. And many of us work in revenue profit companies. Yeah. So yes, there's lots of public sector, lots of not-for-profit, but the bulk of people work in for-profit organizations. And when the pressure is on, uh, I mean, people do inhumane things to ensure that their targets are met or that the budget is met, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'm not suggesting that I live in a fairyland where, you know, that, that profits aren't supposed to increase or revenues aren't supposed to increase. Like, I get it. I mean, I've worked in some of the biggest, largest companies publicly traded. But what I do do take umbrage with is when leadership only fixates on revenue and profit. That's when things fall apart from a purpose perspective. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's the difference between external motivation opposed to a purpose-driven organization that creates intrinsic motiv motivation. Yeah, I mean, let's, let, we, I think I mentioned Patagonia a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. So let's just unravel that for a second. Why are they often used in case studies of purpose? Well, because the CEO actually goes around saying, don't buy our clothes. <laughs> don't buy our stuff. Like, we don't want you to buy our stuff. It's like, what? Aren't you trying to run a business? And what he's basically saying is, look, you know, I, okay, you can buy our stuff, but don't buy lots of our stuff. Just buy one thing. And he's basically saying, 
we're not here to grow like incredibly through the roof. We're not trying to be a gazillion dollar company. Yeah. Growth for the sake of growth is not a strategy. And, and that's, that's beautiful in my mind because, you know, we're running out of oxygen in this planet. And so we don't need to grow to the point of us having to go find another planet to live on. Dan, I know you're, you're an expert in the area of employee engagement. So why do you feel that purpose is something that really underpins employee fulfillment and, and motivation? What is it? I think, well, the reason I wrote the Purpose Effect book is it followed on my first book about culture, and that was called Flat Army. And what I felt was and what I was doing inside of the organizations I was working with is that there's a yin-yang between culture and, or engagement, right, and purpose. Like you really can't have one without the other. Yeah. That's, that's what it came down to. And so, you know, what's, well, what's culture? What's engagement? Well, those are the attributes, the behaviors, you know, the, um, the organizational disciplines, the way in which that you're treating one another. That's, you know, do you have a once a year performance management appraisal or do you have frequent coaching conversations, right? That's where, you know, training is an event. Or is it learning on a continuous platform kind of all the time, right? Those are the fair practices. Those are the culture practices. Those are the engagement practices that allow people to say, oh, this is a pretty cool place to work at. But if, you, if that organization is still operating in, an or, in a way in which that doesn't fulfill your personal purpose, mm. like why you're here in this life, what you want to do, your growth, your development, your decision on who I am. And or that organization, again, is too fixated on bureaucracy and power or profit and not for the greater good of society, then then it doesn't like the engagement doesn't matter because you're not going to be engaged. It's actually a yin yang. It's a syn- it's a synchronicity between the two concepts. And I'm really interested to learn more about that alignment between personal purpose and organizational purpose and that sweet spot, because I think that's something that a lot of leaders struggle with. And um, in fact, I was reading a report by Harvard Business Review on the business case for purpose. And it stated that whilst 90% of leaders knew that purpose was good for business, only 46% implemented purpose-driven business strategy, meaning we have 54% of leaders who have no idea really how to identify, articulate, or integrate a purpose-driven business strategy. Why do you think that might be the case? (laughs) Well, my honest answer is that there's a lot of leaders around there that uh, are employing the ATNA concept, all talk, no action. Yeah, right. Uh, Yep. Yeah, right. So they talk a good game, but then when rubber hits the road, they're like, eh, no, I think I need to go make my numbers because the market or the analysts or the, the stock folks, the financiers are saying, hey, you told us you're going to make, you know, 5% more revenue this year and you only made 4%. Like, what's wrong with you? And then they don't get bonus or incentivized. So there's a whole other dark uh, concept, I would say, to many of these for-profit organizations and having to fixate on that. Yeah. And I mean, I I point that question out purely because when we're talking about culture and the yin and yang of employee engagement, surely all of this starts at the top. Well, (laughs) um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to shock you and become a little positive right now. I think we're, (laughs) um, I think we're actually on the cusp of a transition. Yeah. So I do believe that, You know, the past five to 10 years, it has been a lot of lip service and a lot of, yeah, we believe in it, but they don't actually do things about it. But but what's beginning to occur is that those that kind of risked their careers or risked their organization's future, I'm using air quotes, obviously in a podcast right now, you can't see those. So they risked their future of the organization by... um, to sort of re-vectoring the organization such that it could move towards the purpose mindset, uh, they're in fact now doing really, really well. <laughs> so their their financials are outperforming mm. um, those that are not sort of on the purpose case. And, and what I mean by that is um, there are some first followers that are, are taking advantage of that. 
And and I would have liked to have seen way more people, you know, long ago get on this train. Mm. But but because there are some case studies, because there are examples of organizations now that in fact have said, you know, yeah, actually, um, the way in which that we are operating this purpose, you know, concept. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think it'd work, but it's actually working. So. So yeah. Well, and- I know. Um, I know Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock um, Management, did a big letter to all of the CEOs this year, which was titled "Purpose and Profit," and and really highlighted some of the incredible links between purpose and profit, but also the significance of the millennials coming through, who we know are the most purpose driven generation to exist, and and they they currently take up thirty five percent of the global workforce. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, think, think, think is like my, my hero these days. Yeah. I mean, they are what, what, you know, uh, the economist calls the world's largest shadow bank. Yeah. And for its CEO and chairperson to now three years in a row to his annual letter to shareholders, uh, suggest that, you know, the only way in which you really should be operating is through the balance of purpose with profit. Uh, you know, that's my hero. Yeah, we need, well, more, I mean, we need more layer of things. Something else he highlighted that I thought was fascinating was the fact that he he believed that consumers were kind of losing faith in the government to solve social issues, and because of that, were were putting more pressure on CEOs and corporate organisations to be accountable for social outcomes. Yeah, indeed. I mean. You know, you've got some classic examples like Mark Benioff at Salesforce, CEO yep. and founder of Salesforce, Paul Pullman of Unilever, who has since retired uh, last December. But th- those are kind of what I would, uh, I mean, I don't like the term, but for lack of a better term, they are the CEO activists. Yeah. Right. They're, they're some of the, the, the great men and women out there that have said, look, you can operate differently. You can think about a sustainable living plan, so to say. And, and you can, you know, inculcate your culture internally such that it's in full of engaged people who also uh, subscribe to the purpose mindset or the purpose effect within what they do in their role in their life and their company. Like that's, that's kind of beautiful to me when you have those examples. So, so my point being of being a little bit more positive is that there's a bit of a, I mean, it's, it's, it's shallow, it's slow, but it's a bit of a tipping point. Absolutely. And some people are calling that tipping point the the purpose economy. And I have a few more questions about that later on as well. Yeah, Um, sure. Now, for any leaders out there listening, you know, you go about your day to day, you do the same things, same systems, same processes. How would you advise a leader to begin to, to create the space to make the changes towards becoming a more purpose driven organization? Well, I think one of the ways that you really start having to think about this is um, is 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 a kind of a, a, a scorecard of sorts. I mean, mm. leaders love scorecards, right? If it moves, measure it, as Peter Drucker once said. And so, from um, from thinking about you know the engagement scoring of your people, maybe your diversity uh, scoring, maybe how much money you're spending on people, you know, the development of people. I mean, those seem like pretty easy, low hanging fruit concepts, right? Yeah. But, but then you start thinking about customers. You're like, okay, so when we change the narrative from a marketing perspective um, or a product development perspective, when you change the narrative such that you're saying, look, this is what our mission is. This is our purpose. We are here to serve society. And here's how we're going to measure that. Here's how our products are going to be better for the environment, for our customers. This is why we're doing what we do. We're not just in it for money. Like when you change that narrative, maybe then you can start tracking how your customers believe you're being honest, uh, trusting, right? Reliable. You know, what's the relationship that you're building with them? What's the the relatedness? What are the metrics of meaning? Yeah. Yeah. What are the metrics of meaning? That's just it. Mm. But then you're like, okay, well, what are we doing in the community? So do you have uh, a plan in which to donate hours into the community as a team? Are you actually donating dollars to the community? 
Are you donating time or service, I should say, into the community or products? So uh, an example back to Mark Benioff is that, you know, he started the 1% pledge, um, which is a way for Salesforce and other organizations that want to sign up with 1% pledge to donate 1% of uh, after-tax profit, 1% of time, and 1% of their products and services back to the community. So it's, it's all kinds of little tweaks that you can make that aren't, aren't really dramatically drastic to your bottom line. What it does, in fact, is then get the customer saying, oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I might put my dollars uh, to that organization going forward. Like, let me give you an example. So uh, in North America, and I, I know they're in Asia, but I'm not sure if they're in Australia, there's this sausage-making company called Johnsonville Sausage. And, and when Johnsonville Sausage uh, had a fire at one of their production plants where 110 people worked but no one was injured, the whole place melted down. Mm. And so the, the, the leadership team of Johnsonville brought those 110 people into a room and said, look, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. We believe in you. I know there's nowhere for you to work right now, but we're going to keep you whole. We're going we're gonna to pay you for as long as it takes to rebuild the factory. And they only said, the, they said two things. They said, look, uh, we just want you to donate 20 hours a week to the community, volunteering, like, you know, cleaning up garbage, building parks, whatever. And for 20 hours a week, we want you to go back to school and we'll pay for that. And it took almost a year to rebuild that plant. Like, that, that's Well, firstly, I mean, guess. that's massive contribution. But what I love about that is it's not only purpose, it's personalized because he, they actually enabled yeah. their staff to make a personal decision around, well, who do they want to donate their time to or what do they need to do um, in terms of advancing their own personal development that they they enabled the people to have enough choice to tap into what was personal about their expression of purpose. Right. Precisely. Yeah. Well yeah. Could have said it better. A beautiful example. And whilst on that subject, um, I want to unpack the components of the purpose effect, which we've already touched on. So I, the way I saw the purpose effect was kind of like a trinity of meaning, of meaning. And within that trinity, we had three forces, including the activation of personal purpose, the activation of organisational purpose, and the activation of role-based purpose. Somewhere in the middle of these three forces, uh, you spoke about the sweet spot, which propels the purpose effect in an organisation. Let's start off with personal purpose. Now, I, I believe that purpose is a conscious choice. So if I'm leading a team, what can I do to inspire people to make that choice and to get conscious about the pursuit for meaning, uh, both personally and professionally? You know, for me... Um I, I have, so this is going to sound weird, but bear with me. Um, if I'm in front of an audience and that audience is mostly men and it's usually in high tech and it's a keynote of some sort, I'll introduce my own self as Dan, the metrosexual feminist from Canada. <laughs> Love that intro. <laughs> And, you know, the men are looking at me like I'm from Mars, mostly. Yeah. Uh, but I have always been a metrosexual feminist. And to decode that phrase, it just means that at home, you know, I'm the decorator. I'm the one who puts up all the Christmas ornaments. I'm the one who shops for Denise. Like, I'm, I'm like a designer wannabe, right? I mean, I'm not, quote, a man's man, right? I don't, I don't go to fraternities or man functions or whatever. And our roles were kind of reversed because Denise takes care of, uh, she fixes things up around the house, but, you know, whatever. But the feminist part, and everyone's scared of that word too, it seems. And that just means equality. That's really fundamentally what it means. It's equality for all. So, so for me, my personal declaration of purpose, which is we're not here to see through each other. We're here to see each other through is that notion that I'm coming to work or life as me. I'm here to help you. I'm a feminist. I'm a metrosexual man. And I don't care. But I'm here to help you. So 
over the years, I've become more confident in saying that. Mm -hmm. Difficult to say when I was 17 or 18 because I was growing up in a very blue collar steel town in Canada. And I, you know, would get mocked at for kind of my way of being. But eventually, you know, in my sort of early 20s, I was like, you know, the hell with this. I am going to be me. So, but, but I've continuously developed myself towards that personal purpose. I have defined myself, hence the point of the declaration of purpose. Mm. And I have a decision every day to show up with my full self as that kind of metrosexual feminist who's unabashedly unafraid to help somebody. That's just why I'm here. I love that beautiful explanation. And I think the most beautiful thing about it is in making that conscious choice, it's about giving yourself permission to express every part of who you are and then to to find a narrative, to be able to define that and find a story about that that you not only influence yourself with, that you can then share with the world. Mm, yeah. And again, like there's there's all kinds of great examples of people that are doing this. So it's not just Dan, by any stretch, yeah. right? But I, I do believe that um, there's, uh, how should you say this? There's culpability for us as people and the leaders who lead us in our organization, meaning we owe it to ourselves to act with that type of confidence in order to define and develop and decide what our personal purpose is. But actually, if, if there's a leader in that organization who's not asking the questions of that employee that aren't work-related, that aren't role-related. They're about life, mm. the life question. Like, not just, Dan, how was your weekend? Or, Rebecca, you know, did you have a flat white yesterday with your mate? It's, how are you? And what are you trying to be when you grow up? How can I help you? Mm. What legacy Do are we know? creating today? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that goes back to the earlier point, Rebecca, about how I said that, um, you know, some leaders come to work with a Teflon suit on or, or you know, whatever, right? A, a different yeah. mask. Well, okay. Do you really need to have that different mask and different suit? Could you not just be a uh, human? How, well, how about this for your, for your Aussie friend? How about employee fair income in the way in which that you operate <laughs> as a leader? I'm stealing that one. <laughs> Love it. Yep. Seriously. Yeah. Like, why not just sort of um, be genuine with everyone around you, which is essentially what third income is. Yep. And, and, and be genuine is to ask the question of that individual person. I know, I know that you're an employee and I'm your boss, but why don't we have a conversation about purpose? Why don't we have a conversation about you? You know, what are you trying to be when you grow up? How can I help you? That's fair income. And, and it's how can I help us? Because if we really create the space to deeply listen to someone and to really understand the significance of their contribution um, in their life, but, but particularly in the workplace, that's something that benefits everybody. Oh, totally. Yeah. So, okay. So, so then let's go back to the culture and engagement question, right? Because this is where the yin-yang comes into such important place. So it doesn't matter what research you look at. For the past 20 years, uh, employee engagement scores, whether it's Oz or New Zealand or Asia or North America, they're the same. Nothing has changed. It's basically 30%-ish around there, depends on the country, of the people in an organization are, quote, engaged. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means... Uh, they, they come to work sort of fulfilled with meaning, with purpose, you know, uh, they do a good job. They go above and beyond the call of duty. You know, they love what they do. They're like, uh, you have me at hello. I love this gig. Right. So, but the other 70% ish, um, are somewhere between like sitting on their hands, wondering why they're there or they're walking to work with a match and they're going to light the place on fire because they hate it so much. Mm. And that's, I mean, that's, that's difficult for guys like me who are trying to help leaders be better leaders because I really wish it was opposite. I wish it was 70% engaged and 30% the other. I mean, you're never going to get 100, but if we flipped it, that would be my goal before, Absolutely. you know, I turn myself over to, yeah. 
and and I think you know that kind of energy is infectious. You know, so we we all need to be as leaders, but as individuals going to work, to be mindful and conscious of the energy we bring to work, because you know it, it is infectious. If if we we bring uh, that disengagement, that disconnection, that's something that can bring a whole culture down. Oh. Well, <laughs> talk about, I mean, look, we're, we're talking about Wells Fargo like five yeah. minutes ago. That I, There's an example, right? Like for those of you that are listening in, just type in Wells Fargo and, um, uh, and, and Tim Sloan, their CEO. Like it's a disaster. And again, why? Because of a fixation on two things, profit and and doing unethical things, which causes the disengagement. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a, it's going to be a case study for the ages, I assure you. And, and I think as individuals as well going, going into the workplace, the one thing that getting clear on our personal purpose does for us, I believe it gives us an optimistic narrative. And in forming that optimistic narrative that's uh, propelling us into our future that enables us to have an optimistic mindset. So even when we deal with challenges mm-hmm. or situations where, you know, where we might feel a little uncomfortable or a little uncertain or a little bit of fear come up, because we have consciously made a decision to view the world through optimism, we then navigate the world with that same optimism and I believe attract it back in to our world. Um, so, you know, I think that's an incredibly powerful part of, of the purpose story or the purpose statement, as you put it. Gosh, this is so good. You're right. That's exactly it. <laughs> well said. So, look, I'm going to dive back into your book now. Um, now, I okay. just I just spoke about purpose, really, as, as being something that propels us into the future. And, and because of that, it's a type of evolution. So a question for you. With that in mind, I know a lot of people say start with why when it comes to purpose. And, look, I completely believe that purpose and our why are linked However, if purpose is an evolutionary force propelling us into tomorrow, how can we start with something that to me generally exists in the past? So if we think about why we did something, we're like, why did I feel that way? Why did I act a certain way? And and we're reflecting opposed to looking at a narrative that propels us into our future self and a higher potential. Well, um, you, you sort of had me at hello there. I, <laughs> as much as as much as I respect Simon and the work, I don't believe you start with why. Yeah, I don't either. I really don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's it's really a question of um, what mm. <laughs> what am I what am I today? What am I trying to become? What am I doing to get there? I mean, I, I understand the question, right, about, you know, start with why or the statement. But it really does come down to at least how I've defined it as those three Ds. What am I doing to develop myself mm. to, to enact or to unleash or to unlock some sort of purpose? Because what if you, if you start with why, you may not – no, what the why is. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I always found it a little confusing purely because you can ask somebody why and they can come up with a 100 perfectly valid answers as to why they do something, but how does that enable you to get clarity of purpose if you've got a 1,000 valid answers to a question? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, that was always so, how I thought about it anyway. But. Well, it's just for me, again, the other thing is, if you start with why I get to the point of why not, meaning why, why not can't I do something else? And, yeah. and I think, as I've, I've said many times before, purpose is a journey, and I don't think there is necessarily one definition of your purpose, i.e. we've talked about personal or and role. But even when you, know, you, know, you decide that it's like, okay, this, this, is, this is what I am, this is what I'm doing, something comes along and can trigger something. You're like, well, I never thought of that before. Well, I'm going to start changing my what and my, my how. I'm going to mm. like, and you're tweaking. I think that's what purpose is this. I mean, we're all on a journey to the waterfall. Yeah. It's the old 
First, First Nations adage, like, you know, uh, death becomes to us all, right? So on that journey to the waterfall, am I, am I going to start with why? <laughs> am I going to say, okay, this is me all the way to the waterfall? what I am of this day and what I'm trying to be, and then it might change again. That's, that's purpose when you're not, um, it's the forward motion still. Mm. Yeah. It's the forward Forward. motion. And and I believe it's aspirational. It's got that brightness of the future. And and I think that comes from getting very clear on the what, what, you know, what am I today? What, how am I contributing? What am I today? What do I hope to be tomorrow? Brilliant. That's precisely. You had me at hello. (laughs) <laughs> so in looking at this idea, if if we've started to get clear on our journey of personal purpose, we then have what you referred to as role-based purpose. And, you know, while we're on the subject of, of debunking purpose myths, one of them is, you know, oh, I have to leave my job to pursue my purpose or I've got to go and leave, you know, got to go and join the circus to pursue my purpose. For those people yeah. who are maybe at, at work at the moment and they're wanting to connect their personal purpose to their role, how can they go about doing that in the present moment today without joining the circus or leaving their job? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it, yeah, well, and that's, that's the point about purpose is it's multi-layered and there's different facets to it, right? Yeah. So you have, you have to look for the, the proverbial low-hanging fruit the ways in which those interconnections can occur. So what's your personal purpose, right? So there are going to be multiple levels of your purpose um, on your personal purpose. Sorry. So, so guy like me, I'm out there trying to help people. I like speaking. I like writing. I like cycling. uh, I like learning. I like books. I, I like there's, I like creativity. I like designing. I do dried flowers. Like there's just so many likes that I have that then I have to look at all of those likes and versus the dislikes, and I have to adjudicate those against my role. And inside of my role, I have to look, if I don't like the role outright, I still have to look for some of those opportunities that then mesh where my personal purpose is with where the role is and the Mm. objectives or the job classification of the role. So maybe, again, there's transferability of things like creativity or writing or comprehension or what, whatever it is. And if you've got nothing, like nothing, then, I mean, they may be like the job. And- yeah. So moving on from there, the next component is organizational purpose. And look, I think that sometimes people can throw organizational purpose into the CSR or social impact category, which, which that's definitely a part of it. But I love the fact that you cited organizational purpose as being something that in your words requires the implementation and the deliverance of solid fair practices, involves compensation, performance management, and recognition. In your experience, how do all of these influences inform organizational purpose and how does the purpose affect at organizational level serve team members, customers and, and the community as a whole? It's a beautiful question, Rebecca. So let me unpack it two ways. Uh, first to the former and then come back to the latter. So what I find is um, somewhere between comical and deleterious is an organization who suggests that CSR is akin to purpose. So first of all, it's not. (laughs) Uh, Those organizations that are confusing corporate social responsibility with purpose don't get it. CSR is a component of organizational purpose. It's an important component, but it's only like one-fifth of the way there. So there's other things to do, notwithstanding the point you just made, like performance management or uh, recognition or um, the support functions inside the org, what have you. And, and again, because I come at all of this from an organizational design and development background, uh, I look at this as a pr- from a pragmatic kind of humanistic way. Mm-hmm. For an organization to deliver purpose, uh, it, it ought to, it must deliver fair practices because if those practices are not fair to the employee, uh, whether that is, you know, uh, compensation pay scales out of whack, you know, men making more than women for the same job, for example, 
uh, once a year performance reviews, as opposed, as I said earlier, right, kind of coaching conversations that are frequent, um, recognition programs that are, you know, just uh, giving someone a medal for being in the organization for 10 years, as opposed to recognizing the process, the effort, you know, the continuum. Those are all fair practices. And, and when that organization says, you know, we are purpose driven, they are looking at things in a, in, in, in multi-dimensional way. What are the fair practices for the employee? How do we then like delight customers through that engaged fair practice employee? Uh, what are we doing with our decision making? So decision making is fair, is ethical, is um, is inclusive. Mm. It doesn't mean that uh, all employees are in on the final decision. But how about in certain cases, talk about fair practices allowing uh, uh, sort of uh, employees to inform with feedback on some decisions. Like that to me is all about purpose. It's, it's that organization saying, look, we're not just in it for ourselves, i.e. the C-suite or the senior leaders. We're in it for stakeholders. And employees are a key, crucial stakeholder. Absolutely. They're imperative. And, and the, what I love about what you're saying, it's, it's almost that purpose acts as an integrity anchor by which we can gauge our decisions, the way we communicate, the way we engage and involve our, our employees, the stakeholders, the community, that, that purpose is an anchor by which we can hold, hold our ground with that anchor and, and have something by which to guide those decisions and, and to influence from. Totally. I mean, you've got, uh, there's, a, there's an example with this grocery store in America, in Massachusetts, called uh, Market Basket. Yeah. And, and here's an example, right? So Market Basket had this CEO who always wanted to give more discounts to customers and wanted to increase the salaries of employees, like all the time. He was just always doing it. He was like, this is, this is how I operate. This is how it should work. But then, you know, um, his board... Uh, sort of got wind of this and and they wanted to keep the profits and they wanted to increase customer um, pricing and they they fired a CEO Arthur Demoulis but then here's what happens when purpose takes over so they fired him and the employees went berserk like the employees were like what like Arthur's our guy like mm. he's been he's been so good to us why would you fire him and then the customers found out and the customers were like, well, you guys fired Arthur. Well, he treated us well and he treated the community well and he treated the employees well. Uh, we're going to boycott you. And there was like this six week uh, long boycott of these like 35 grocery stores in Massachusetts because these senior leaders were fixated only on profits and not on purpose. Mm. And then eventually, you know, that C-suite or the, the board, sorry, had to rehire Arthur DeMullis back because it was six weeks of craziness, like no revenue, you know, all the stores were shut down, like was crazy yeah. things going on. Hey, you want a loss yeah? in profit, was, here it, you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But there's, the, there's when purpose can instruct leaders. It's like, Here's a guy who's doing the right thing for community, for customer, for employee. Those are fair practices that he's employing, right? Back to the org purpose. And, and when the board ousted him, right, they made a calculated error. And it, it came back to bite them because they, are, they had to bring Arthur back. Otherwise, these stores were going to go belly up, like overarchingly. Yep. Yeah, so purpose, again, purpose was the integrity anchor that actually existed in the people, not just those other senior leaders involved, and, and they spoke. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. Thank you for sharing that. So within these three forces, you referenced the sweet spot earlier in our conversation. So as an organisation, how do we know when we've hit the sweet spot? And taking that one step further, how do we maintain that sweet spot in a sustainable way? Well, uh, what you have in the sweet spot is twofold, right? It's a personal sweet spot. So that's you as the individual 
uh, looking at the lens of the three types of purpose and saying, yeah, that's me. I, I know who I am. I've, I'm continuing to develop. I, I've got my mojo. I know what my personal purpose is. I'm feeling tickety-boo. I really like this organization. I don't like all of it, but I like, I like it. I like what it's doing. You know, it's, and, and I like my role. I mean, I feel purpose in my role. I feel value. So you are um, assessing yourself in that, you know, three-legged stool, if you will. So that's an individual assessment. But then, of course, if you're the organization and you're the senior leaders, whether you're the head of HR or people in culture, whether you're the CFO, COO, CO, the C-suite, whoever, right? When, what you need to be doing is asking yourself uh, the question, how many stakeholders do I have in the sweet spot? And, of course, the stakeholders are made up of employees, customers, and arguably uh, supply chain partners, and if you're a for-profit, publicly traded company, shareholders. So what you need is, is, is as many stakeholders as you can get into that sweet spot. And so when you have an organizational purpose that is reflective of serving all stakeholders and not just shareholders, again, the studies are proving that you end up, quote, winning, winning being you have higher levels of engagement, higher levels of customer satisfaction, higher levels of productivity, lower absenteeism, and if you're publicly traded, greater shareholder return. That's the sweet spot for you in the C-suite. Mm. And when you are operating that way, it's, a, it's again, a, another win-win. More employees feel the sweet spot and they're like, yay, I need to get more people working here. I'm going to stay. I love it. And you don't have to worry about attrition or rehiring or reskilling or all these crazy things that go on in orgs today. And if you're the C-suite, you're like, huh, this is working out. I really like this. You got a bunch of engaged employees, happy partners, happy suppliers, happy uh, customers, obviously, and a fair return financially. And, and I think what we're beginning to see, which I think is so exciting, is that sweet spot is beginning to extend business to business. And I think this is really what's starting to form the bones of, of the emerging purpose economy and a really amazing time for the pursuit of meaning. Uh, to give you an example, I interviewed uh, on a podcast last week the founder of a business called Collabosaurus, and we were chatting about the collaboration between Adidas and Pali for the Oceans, who created sports shoes made out of ocean plastic which I thought was just a genius marketing strategy, but mm. also one that's yeah. so significant to to the world and, and to um, to the oceans, but just social impact in general. Brilliant. I mean, again, I think that there's, there's a slow moving starting to get it. It's like, so Rebecca, um, I'm 47. Yeah. And that means that I'm uh, old enough to have been on several flights from uh, Toronto, Canada to London, England to go visit my family when I was a kid. And those flights were full of smoke. It's hard to even thought, consider that these days, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the new planes these days don't even have no smoking signs. Because you don't need them. Yeah. Still, so I remember as a kid getting a- onto planes, and you'd see the ashtrays in the um, in the on the arm supports. Yeah. Uh, it's it's yeah. It's, it's just so hard right? to imagine that so now. What, what, yeah. My my point is this, right? Yeah. My point is, um, we're going to look back, I hope, <laughs> and analogously say, "Gosh, why did we allow smoking on airplanes?" let alone why did we allow smoking. But why did we allow smoking on airplanes? That was a dumb idea, wasn't it? I think we're going to look back and say, why didn't we operate with a higher sense of purpose in our organization? That was a dumb idea. And so while on the subject of, of what's possible in the future, I noted in your LinkedIn profile that you're, you referred to yourself as the, the human whisperer, which I thought was beautiful. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Is purpose fundamentally human and in workplaces of the future that 
I uh, will be, you know, will be driven by automation and artificial intelligence and, and lots of other disruptive trends. Do you think that purpose is the one attribute that will enable us to define what it is to be human in, in a whole new world? Oh, wow. What a question. Um, it, I, I, I mean, the short answer is yes, I truly, truly believe that. And again, if you start looking at some of the data and what, again, as this slow moving mass towards a more purpose driven society is, is heading toward the CEOs, uh, the senior leaders are beginning to wake up. And you, you need not look anywhere further than, you know, Davos and the World Economic Forum. And, and, and as the rate of automation um, increases, so the division of labor, for example, right, the, the, the share of hours spent um, on a whole is shifting from today, 70% human and 30% machine. In, in six or seven years' time, it's going to be about a 50-50 split. So as the division of labor shifts such that um, there's more machines doing a greater share of the, of the labor, I see that as good. Mm. Only if this happens. Only if this happens, though. It's good if we take that other 20% and reinvest it back into the human condition of our organizations. If we discard that other 20% and the people who were doing that 20%, I, I get quite worried. But if, if leaders say, no, we are now going to use that time in which to fuel a better way in which to operate from people to people, the human condition, the empathy, the leadership, the emotional intelligence, right? All, the, all of the that purpose. and um, our ability to transform, you know, our adaptability quotient. How are we able yes. to evolve and, and let a new environment inform our purpose and shift it and enable us to create a new vision for our future? That exactly. Mm. And so if, if we get that right, which, you know, I'm a half full guy of the, of the proverbial glass, then, then I, I see the, uh, the coming automation increase, the AI, the chatbots, the robots, right? I see that as a good thing so long as we commit to this sense of reinvesting the emotional quotient intelligence of purpose inside that org. I really do. So, look, I think any thought leader or influencer in the purpose space would, like you and I, no doubt spend a lot of time pondering the question of purpose. In your recent reflections, is there anything new or unique or anything that you believe will emerge when it comes to purpose that we haven't already discussed? I suspect that as, as the organizations wake up and, and look at themselves and say, what, what are we doing or what are we not doing from from a gender parity perspective, mm. I argue and profess to you that the more we think about equality, compensation, composition, C-suites, boards, such that there is finally gender parity, then I also believe that it's going to make the quest or the path to purpose a hell of a lot easier. Mm. I I believe that, but I also think as as a woman that decoding purpose and understanding purpose as a path to step into our potential also enables us an empowered pathway to close that gap. Oh, I I couldn't agree more. I I really I really do. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's a, a beautiful a, a beautiful um, focus, I think, for purpose moving forward. Gosh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Um, I just got so much out of our conversation today and I have no doubt uh, the listeners of Decoding Purpose will be as moved um, by your 
your insights, the tools that you've shared, and and your personal story of purpose. Um, it's been an honor to have you on. Thank you for your time. Uh, you know what? Right back at you. I enjoyed our discourse. Time flew. It feels like we chatted for seven minutes, but uh, probably hasn't been seven. <laughs> but I want to thank you because uh, it's people like you who are uh, taking taking that conch, that megaphone, that microphone, and they're they're yelling at the world with benevolence and kindness to say, "Hey, look, there's another way to operate." And good on you. Um, for employing sort of a fair dinkum to the concept of decoding purpose. Really love it. I'm excited to announce a partnership that I am personally so passionate about. And that partnership is with Ambezi. Ambezi are a brand new tech platform and they are connecting entrepreneurs and business people who have amazing stories to share with the next generation. So the way Ambezi works is it connects entrepreneurs with local schools and local universities and the intention is to inspire, educate and activate purpose and passion for the next generation. All you need to do to give one hour is log on to www.ambezi.com.